Good morning. Today our verse is taken from a very familiar psalm. Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. That's the New Living Translation. This is one of the most familiar passages in the Old Bible. The only other passage that might possibly be more familiar would certainly be John 3.16. The Psalms were constantly on the lips of Jews, and this Psalm is one of the best known and the greatest. It's a Psalm of David, who grew up as a shepherd. This is his reflection on how the relationship of a shepherd and his sheep compares with the relationship of God to his people. We don't know when David wrote this. It may have been a young shepherd on a Judean hillside with a gentle bleeding of sheep in the background. Or maybe it was written after defeating the giant Goliath that David recognized in order to have completed this task, it could not have been done in his own strength. In this psalm, David has changed his role from being the shepherd to being one of the sheep cared for by the great shepherd. How often have we heard the phrase, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Let's reflect on our shepherd as we first meet him in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Our shepherd is the creator of everything beautiful that we see on and that we see from our little tiny planet called Earth. He created an estimated 100 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy. Our galaxy is only one of an estimated 200 billion galaxies in the universe. The estimate on the number of stars in the universe, of which our sun is just one small, tiny star, is the number one followed by 24 zeros. One septillion stars that our creator our shepherd, made in the beginning. The creator of all this is the good shepherd who cares for you and for me. One of the greatest human needs is to belong. To belong to a family, our church, community organizations, etc. But can you even begin to fathom? We belong to the flock of Christ. Life can be so much better when we realize that we belong to and are cared for by the Good Shepherd, the creator of everything that we see around us. In biblical times, a single flock could have a few sheep or hundreds. A Good Shepherd knew each of the individual sheep in the flock, regardless of how big the numbers would be. Jesus in uh, John 10, verses 3 to 5, reminds us how the good shepherd knows the flock. And it says, the gateway opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. David uses this metaphor of the shepherd in Psalm 23, verse 1, to describe the relationship between God and his children. With a population on our little planet of just over 7.8 billion, isn't it great to know that God knows each one of us by name. He knows each one of us, the circumstances that we are facing all this morning. He not only knows, but he cares. 
He showed the extent of his love in his willingness to send Christ into the world. John 3.16, the cornerstone of the gospel, reminds us that God so loved that he gave. John 1.12 reminds us that to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, to become part of his flock, to belong to his pasture. The creator of this entire universe is your shepherd. He's my shepherd. He cares for his sheep and showed the extent of his love by giving his life uh, for his sheep. There are numerous times in this journey of life that from a human perspective, things that are occurring within our lives makes absolutely no sense. In those times, the enemy would try to cause us to question and try to sow seeds of doubt that the Good Shepherd is actually guiding our lives. With the help of the Holy Spirit, we have to continue to be aware that the Good Shepherd continues to be with us and he is directing our path. With his help, we can claim the promise from Philippians 4.13, that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Whatever you may be facing today, remember, the good shepherd is right there with you. He loves you eternally, and he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Lean on him today for the challenges that you are facing. He is your good shepherd, and he will never leave you alone. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful today that you are indeed our good shepherd. So thankful, Father, that you showed us the extent that you care for us by sending your one and only son to come into this world knowing that he would be beaten, he would be abused, and that he would be crucified, and that he would give his life for each of us so that we could become your children, so that we could become part of your family, we could be part of your flock. So thankful, Father, that you are our shepherd. So thankful, Lord, for the way that you guide, lead, and direct us. And we just ask, Father, that you will help each of us to be more and more sensitive to your precious Holy Spirit as you guide our lives. Father, we realize that there are many in our congregation who are going through very difficult times. Many are dealing with health issues. Many are walking through the deep valley of grief. Some are facing financial challenges. Many others, Lord, have challenges that are only known to you. And today, Father, we just bring each of your children into your presence. We ask, Father, that they will feel your peace and that they will be aware of your comfort. Father, for those who are watching this service online today, we ask that you will be with them, that you will surround them, that they will sense your presence. Father, for those who will be attending our in-service, we just ask, Father, that your blessing will be upon their lives as well. May your Holy Spirit minister uh, to each person as they participate in this service today. Father, we ask for a special blessing on Pastor Brian today as he speaks. We ask, Father, that he will just be an instrument that will be used for your honor and for your glory. Father, we ask that you will continue to use him to show your, your love to our church and to our community. Lord, as we look forward to this week, should you tarry, we ask that as your children, we will show forth your peace, we will show forth your love in a society which is so challenged in so many ways, so many frustrations, so many difficulties that people are facing. And Father, in the midst of those, may your love and may your peace just permeate from our beings and just open doors, Lord, so that we will have opportunity 
to share with others that when we have the good shepherd who is guiding our lives, directing our path, that that will make all the difference in this journey of life. We ask now, Father, for your blessing on this service, and we ask those things in your wonderful name. Amen. Beneath the surface of my anxious imagination Beckons a calmness that is found in you alone It washes over every doubt, every imperfection Jesus, your presence is the comfort of my soul. There's nowhere I'd rather be when you're singing over me. I just want to be here with you. I'm lost in your mystery. I'm found in your love for me. I just want to be here with you. Even though waiting, I won't worry about tomorrow. No need to focus on the things I can. Thank you. 
tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is Hi, so glad that you've joined us today for our online service. It's Family Day weekend, and the title of my message is Relationships, R-E-A-L, Relationships. 
You know, the past two years have been challenging for families to stay connected in a loving, caring way amidst all the polarizing opinions on, I mean, like, should I even say it? Mass vaccines, convoy, and family gatherings. I really feel for families unprecedented times of stress with long-term effects. But the bottom line is this, when all is said and done with this pandemic, how you treated your family and other people matters. You're going to look back on your relationships, good or bad, with regret or thankfulness. I think there may be a lot of forgiving that's going to happen on both sides of the mask. But I hope it's not too late, and this message can help prevent further strains repair broken relationships, or make existing ones even stronger. See, God cares about you and those that you care for. It's so important to pray for families, pray for our country. This past Monday was Valentine's, and I hope it was a good day. Guys, if you blew it, you can make up for it on family day. It's not too late. Just don't give your kids flowers. It has to be something else on family day. Gift cards are good. McDonald's, Wendy's, Tim's, Starbucks. You get the idea. But make sure that you spend the day as a family. I mean, games, a special meal, an outing. Be together. It is family day weekend, so let's talk about family. Family is God's idea right from the very beginning. And he will do everything to make them strong and healthy. Family is the most important building block, I believe, to society. All the way back to the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, God's plan was for men and women to marry, forming a one flesh union. You can find that in Genesis chapter 2. To have children and become a family. So the family is the essential building block of society ordained by God in his perfect plan. Family is the best place to learn the principles of life and faith, where everything good and godly can be modeled. It can also be a place that does the opposite, abuse, neglect, dysfunction. But either good or bad, it's fair to say that family is the place that shapes a child's lifetime direction. So that's why I want to focus on family this weekend. And I believe that God wants to bless your family. Psalms 128, verse 3 to 4 from the message says, Your wife will bear fruit or bear children as a vine bears grapes. Your household lush as a vineyard. The children around your table as fresh and promising as young olive shoots. Stand in awe of God's yes. Oh, how he blesses the one who fears God. Yes, family are a blessing. But it still takes work, maybe even a lot of work, to make it work. But it's possible. I like what Sam Venable says on how to get along at home. Maybe there's some pointers in here. If you can start the day without caffeine, he says, if you can get along without pet pills, if you can resist complaining and boring people with your troubles, if you can eat the same food every day and be grateful for it, if you can understand when your loved ones are too busy for you anytime, if you can forgive a friend's lack of consideration, if you could overlook it when those who love take it out on you, when through no fault of your own, something goes wrong. If you can take criticism and blame without resentment. If you could ignore a friend's limited education and never correct him. If you can resist treating a rich friend better than a poor friend. If you can face the world without lies and deceit. If you can conquer uh, tension without medical help. If you can relax without liquor. If you can sleep without the aid of drugs. If you can honestly say that deep in your heart you have no prejudice against creed or color, religion or politics and I would add pandemic opinions, <laughs> then, my friend, you're almost as good as your dog. Almost, but not quite. And he says this poem is dedicated to every dog lover in the world from Live a Dog's Life. We lowly humans aren't that lucky. All that to say this, if you're not as good as your dog, you need help. I think it's fair to say that each and every one of us need help, God's help, in our families that they can be the best that God knows they can be. There is no such thing as a perfect family, but every family is unique with its own combination of strengths and weaknesses, and they do take work. There are a lot of stresses today that work against the family. Times have changed since my childhood. So have definitions. Here's a few. Um, adult, a person who has stopped growing at both ends and is now growing in the middle. Balderdash. A rapidly receding hairline. Bathroom. 
a room used by the entire family, believed by all except mom to be self-cleaning. Experience. The men, the name men give to their mistakes. Feedback. The inevitable result when the baby doesn't appreciate the strange carrots. Grocery list. What you spend half an hour writing, then forget to take with you to the store. Hindsight. What one experiences from changing too many diapers. Independent. How we want our children to be as long as they do everything we say. Overstuffed recliner. Mom's nickname for dad. Ow. The first words spoken by children with older siblings. And one more. Top bunk. Where you should never put a child wearing Superman pajamas. Those are some fun definitions, but maybe they bring back a lot of memories. Tells you that there are different families and different experiences. And there are. There, there are functional and dysfunctional families. Maybe we can learn today from June Hunt as she points out in her book, Dysfunctional Family. Uh, and she gives some descriptions of the different family types. She says first, the chaotic family. That's where both household and individuals are poorly organized. The family's plagued by problems. Parents are inconsistent and indecisive. Children are emotionally abandoned. And the result is family members, they're just not connected. The Bible says, and here's the remedy, Proverbs 28, verse 2, a ruler with discernment and knowledge maintains order. There's a controlling family. Structure is overly rigid. Tone is authoritative and dictatorial. Parents tend to be fault-finding and critical. Children are task-oriented. Value is placed on their performance. And the result is this. Family members are fearful and insensitive. The Bible says, and here's the remedy, fathers do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. The coddling family. Parental family is lacking. Feelings are overprotected. Disagreements are avoided. Children are the center of attention. And the result is family members are undisciplined. And the Bible says, and here's the remedy, correction and instruction are the ways to life. Proverbs 6, verse 23. Then there's the codependent family. Conformity is strong within the family. Self-direction is lacking. Uh, parents are overly possessive. The children are smothered. And it results in family members being insecure. And the Bible says, and here's the remedy, Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Love others as they need. I want to look at, and June points this out, the dysfunctional family of Joseph. I want to look at a biblical account. And you'll find that in Genesis chapter 35 to 42, the story of Joseph. And she mentions that God used one of the dysfunctional family or the son of a dysfunctional family, to dramatically and forever change not just one, but 11 dysfunctional families. Now, if you are presently in a dysfunctional family or have come out of one and see similar patterns, I want you to know that there is hope. Joseph is such an example. Genesis 37 talks about his dysfunctional family. We read that he was the 11th son of Jacob who unwisely favored um, Joseph, above all of his other brothers. They were jealous and angry, so out of vengeance, they sold him into slavery instead of killing him. And poor father was told that a wild animal killed him. Joseph ended up in Potiphar's house, falsely accused of attacking his wife, thrown into prison. And this family had all the qualities of dysfunction, poor communication, partiality, jealousy, anger, vengefulness, disloyalty, and bitterness. It never ends well. Chapter 39 and 41 talks about Joseph's walk with the Lord. Yes, he was mistreated, uh, mistreated by his brothers, but the amazing thing is, he didn't let that get the better of him or his relationship with God. He, he could have been bitter, angry, disconnected, but instead his faith stayed intact and he chose by an act of his will to remain. To remain yielded to God's ways, to be obedient to authority, to be trustworthy, to be morally pure, to be faithful, honest, humble, consistent. Joseph, against all odds, lift out Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit or acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. We know that Joseph, like us, would have had his moments, his questions, his concerns, but in spite of his past, he trusted God in the present and for his future. And those paths were straightened because of good and godly choices that he made. 
So that's a lot of dysfunction that's happening in his life. Here's the rest of his story. Genesis chapter 42. While he's in jail, uh, he interprets some dreams for Pharaoh and becomes the second most powerful person in Egypt. And there's a far-reaching famine that affected his brothers and father, and they came to Egypt for food. It's an amazing reunion with twists and turns, but here's the thing about Joseph. After his childhood dysfunction, he didn't seek revenge. He didn't try to get even, though he could have. He could have wiped out the whole family. But instead, he was forgiving, giving, and honoring to God and to his earthly father. Genesis 50 tells us his response to God. When Jacob, their father, dies, the older brothers weren't sure if Joseph was going to all of a sudden change his mind and pay them back now that dad was out of the way. But Joseph chose to focus not on the harm they intended for him, but on the good that God intended for them. His attitude towards God was willing, persevering, and faithful. And maybe one of the main lessons we can learn from Joseph's life is that we don't have to be a prisoner to our past. His mindset in Genesis chapter 50 verse 20 says this, You intended harm to harm me, but God intended it for good. Now this isn't to trivialize your past, but to be able to move on in forgiveness and freedom, knowing that God can bring good even out of bad situations. I like what June writes. She says this, God can use your mess to become a message. And he could use your test to become a testimony. So here's the final type of family. The cultivating family. There's structure and discipline. They're maintained uh, by the parents. There's individual responsibility. There's love and obedience to God that's developed. And the children are secure. And, and the result is family relationships. There's, there's a balance there. Deuteronomy 12 verse 7 says, There in the presence of the Lord your God, you and your family shall eat and shall rejoice in everything you have put your hand to, because the Lord your God has blessed you. It's my prayer that you will be a cultivating family, that you will have the structure and the responsibility and the love and the obedience, and and that you'll grow up secure in your parents' love and in God's love for you as well. He wants to bless your family. I like what Gary Ezzo says that one of the problems with families today is that the husband and wife uh, join hands to form a circle. And that's all good. To form a circle, to be together. But he describes how, how if there's not that balance, things can be upside down. It's so easy to lose focus and lose definition. So he says the husband and wife join hands to form a family circle. And then a child comes along and they place the child in the center with the husband and wife still forming the circle. But now everything revolves around the child. Then a second child comes, and that child is also placed in the center. Now everything revolves around two children. And as the family becomes larger, the center becomes so big that the hands of the mother and father are pulled apart, and the circle is broken. And this is what he says, and it's really good advice. He says that what we must do is form the circle, but with Christ in the center. Then as each child is born, they join hands with mom and dad to make the circle bigger. And the result is that the circle is never broken as long as Christ is in the center. What a great picture. What a great platform. What a great way to raise a family. To put him first. Right in the very center of all the relationships that are most important to us. So I want to look at getting real. The components to a healthy and growing real relationship. The word real, my four points are respect, example, acceptance, and love. So my first point in getting real is respect, mutual respect. Respect is recognizing someone else's worth, honoring them for what they have done or for who they are. It's treating them with care and courtesy. A family are a blessing from God. We're made in the image of God. And our faith should impact our family relationships and how we view one another. 1 Peter 2 verse 17 says, Show proper respect to everyone, to our spouse. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And this verse is right before the wives submitting to husbands and husbands being ready uh, to die for their wives. That's the win-win. But you need to respect one another. 
Ephesians 5, verse 22 to 23. Wives, submit your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. His body, of which he is the Savior. So, in respecting our spouses, also children respecting parents. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 and 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your mother and father, which is the first commandment, with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Obedience, that's a duty, that's an honor that has to do with character. And children are to be brought up to honor and respect their parents. Even when they're grown up, they're to continue to do so through care and support if needed. I remember a friend of mine up north when I was pastoring there. He had a terribly hard upbringing and an abusive father. There was just no love in the family, but he always honored his father. And every Father's Day, he would thank God for the life that was given to him. That was just a powerful testimony and example. As hard as he had it, he still wanted to honor God. Children who honor their parents will be blessed of God. That we're to respect the aged. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 32 says, Rise in the presence of the aged, show respect for the elderly, and revere your God. I am the Lord. 1 Timothy 5 verse 8 says, If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. 1 Timothy 3 verse 4, He must manage his own family well, and see that his children obey him with proper respect. But that respect has to be earned as well. Through his management. Through his care and provision. That we are to respect others. Romans chapter 12 verse 10 says, Take delight in honoring each other. Philippians 2 verse 3 says, Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. See, respect involves showing more concern for people than agendas. Uh, it's thinking highly of others, building them up in love, treating everyone with fairness and integrity. So if you want real relationships or real relationships, respect. Second is example. Examples, they're powerful motivators for good and bad choices in lifestyles. Who we follow and who follows us can set up a cycle of blessing or curses. And our ultimate example is Jesus. We're to follow him. And follow others who follow him. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1 says, You should follow my example, Paul says, just as I follow Christ. In other people we find some characteristics that we would like to follow. Maybe there's quite a few. But in Christ we find all the characteristics that we should follow. When you have a question about what to do, ask what would Jesus have done? Generations, they're blessed by good choices and godly examples. I, I really like the example that I see in 2 Timothy 1 verse 5. Paul is writing to Timothy and he says, I have been reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded, he says, now lives in you also. See, a good example is never wasted. And a good example can go from one generation to another generation to another and that's what makes a godly heritage. And that's to be thankful for. Not taken for granted or neglected. And a godly heritage starts with one person. If you came from a home where there are no other Christian parents or relatives, you can be the first of that heritage. You can be the first one to start that good and godly example that others will follow. So live for Jesus. It might be the hardest thing you do in your family because there's no one else who understands or believes the way you do. But live for Jesus and you will make an example, a difference. You will be an example to them. Parents can be an example to their children. Deuteronomy 4 verse 9 says, Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so you do not forget the things that your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after that. We also look at a children's example to their parents, and, and um, that's a powerful testimony. I remember in the first church that I pastored, there was a, a child who went to um, a Christian daycare, and that child asked Jesus into their heart and went home to this, this family, their family, and told their story. And they saw the difference, the parents saw the difference in this young child's life that Jesus made. And the love that was there. 
And it just so convinced them, and they became Christians as well. It was a household of faith. What a joy and celebration. 1 Timothy 4 verse 12 says, Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. So children can be an example to parents as well and to others. Don't think because you're young that you're off the hook. Be real. And then to one another, uh, it says, let no man despise the youth or don't look down. Let no one look down on you because you are young. Be that example to others as well. Will Fetter says this, our fingerprints don't fade from the lives that we've touched. In a family, children can touch a parent like no one else. I learn lessons from my kids. And over the years, I see amazing things happening in their life and their faith and the decisions that they make. And it gives me that example and a reminder how I should live. And I'm thankful for that. The third is this, acceptance. Acceptance is so important. It allows the person to come into our space to become a friend and on a deeper level um, with marriage to have that true intimacy. And without acceptance, there's rejection and loneliness. But God wants that acceptance to be part of the family makeup. We accept into our lives not only persons, but the gifts from persons, who they are, the expressions from them, um, their interests, their kindness, the time that they would share, that we make room and accept them, and to love them, and to care for them. And I want to say, parents, like, give your children room to grow, and to enjoy each stage. Don't wish a stage away, you know, thinking, I don't want a parent now, I just, I'll, I'll deal with it when they become teenagers, or beyond the teenage years. Enjoy each stage, don't try and rush it. Um, children shouldn't skip through the stages of life. They're already growing up way too fast. So parents, provide for them, take that time, Accept them, uh, understand them throughout all the years and throughout all the stages. Keep on loving them and realize that you're their best chance so that they can grow and develop. So acceptance is so important. Take the time to listen to them. Why they're saying what they're saying, why they're doing what they're doing. Understand their viewpoint. Sort of help them and guide them. Uh, but by accepting them, there's a safe place, a springboard, so to, to speak, that you can bring out the best in them and, and bring God into the center of that relationship. The family unit is made up of individuals, um, but the acceptance should be from, for everyone. And we can learn from one another and we can appreciate one another. Romans 15 verse 7 says, Accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. So we can do that. I like what Brendan Manning, he's one of my favorite authors, he says this, coming around the supper table, if Jesus would appear at your dining table tonight without, with knowledge of everything you are and are not, total comprehension of your life story and every skeleton hidden in your closet, if he laid out the real state of your present discipleship with a hidden agenda, the mixed motives, and the dark desires buried in your psyche, you would feel his acceptance and forgiveness. Accepting others may require us to look at people from a different perspective. And it doesn't mean that we accept or condone their sinful actions, but we love and accept them as unique and special creations of God, that God loves them. And there's hope, there's redemption, but it comes out of relationship. And the last is this, in real relationships, R-E-A-L, love. Love finds a way. Love is the glue. Love is what matters the most. We looked at love last week as part of the Valentine's emphasis. And God's love for us and in us and through us should make a difference in all of our relationships. And a healthy definition of love is crucial to understanding the central message of the Bible. According to the Bible, love is not confined to sexuality. Nor is it primarily a feeling at all. People fall in and out of love. But the Bible says love is a commitment. And as a commitment, it's not dependent on good feelings, but a constant and courageous decision to extend oneself for the well-being of others. It's putting the other person first. It's loving another person as Christ loves them, as he laid down his life for our benefit and theirs. 
The language of love is universal. John 15, 12 says, love each other as I have loved you. Luke 10, verse 27 says, love your neighbor as yourself. Romans 13, 10 says, love does no harm to its neighbor. And Romans 13, verse 8 says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. See, love causes us to be givers, providers, protectors, nourishers, and forgivers. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, Above all, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Kristen Fiola says this, You love others best when you love God most. So in our family, in our relationships, all the different kinds of relationships within a family of uh, mothers, fathers, children, uncles, aunts, grandparents, you know, let love make the difference and have impact as you are formed by others who love and care for you, as you are shaped by God, his amazing love for you and his plan for your life. Remember driving, I saw a church sign, do small things with great love. Even the smallest things on your family day, the words and the, the acts of kindness, if they're, done, if they're small things done, with great love, they'll have a lasting impact. Well, let me just wrap all this up. There's no real way to describe the value of having good intergenerational relationships, but we know it's so important. They bring peace and harmony to a home and they make home a place of respect and example, acceptance and love. We need that. That's God's design. And Jesus Christ, he makes all the difference in our lives and in our homes. It's a foolish man, the Bible says, who builds his house, that is his life, which includes his family, on the sand instead of rock. And a relationship with Jesus enriches relationships with others. You could build on the solid rock, Jesus Christ. You can put him in the center of your relationship, the center of your family. And as he is your focus, he will enrich all the other relationships that you have so evaluate your family relationships what are the different needs that need to be met who are you responsible for what can you do differently what changes need to happen what kind of dysfunction maybe needs to be replaced by function as you read the word as you pray as you uh, look into um, the bible to see even like joseph how his life was changed and affected and was a blessing to others See, God desires you to have good relationships within your family. So ask him to improve those relationships. And if you're a Christian, realize that you're part of a spiritual family, the church. There's an old Sunday school chorus that we used to sing, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Join heirs with Jesus. The family of God is made up of every nation, people, and language. And there's nothing like it because God created it. It's his design, his plan as well, the family of God. I close with this verse, Psalm 68, verse 4 to 6 says, Sing to God, sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides in the clouds. Rejoice before him. His name is the Lord. He's the father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. He is God in his holy dwelling, and God sets the lonely in families. See, in the family of God, there is no one left out. He places you in a family, the family of God, where we are brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. We can care for one another. I trust that you are part of the family of God, that you can connect with a local church, that you can be encouraged and accepted, that you can uh, receive love and give love, that it can be real for you. And God wants to be at the center of your families, and he wants to be at the center of of each church as well. Let's pray. Father, on this family day weekend, we're mindful of the many people who make up our family. Brothers and sisters and spouse, children, uncles, aunts, grandchildren, and so many more. Father, help us to work at those relationships because they're so worth it. Be at the very center, Jesus, of our lives, of our family units. Thank you for coming into our lives and changing us and forgiving us and and replacing, Lord, the dysfunction with function. 
By your spirit of truth, you help us understand the Bible and apply it to our lives and apply your word to the relationships that you want to see made better and whole because of the power that you do through your living word and by your spirit in our lives as we become more like Jesus Christ. Thank you for the family of God, this, this spiritual family. And may we encourage one another in our faith and in our walk of love. Bless each person watching today, each family represented, and each church in our community. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.